<laughs> um, and thanks everyone for being here this morning. Um, it's really good to see you all, even though I'm virtual, I can, I can feel that you're all here. We're all here together. So it's really great. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the experience of depression. Um, and I have been coming to Lions Roar for almost five years now and have been a student of Lama Jempa's since March of uh, 2018. And so I've been having Darshan conversations with Lama for almost five years. And so I think he knows that depression is something that I experience quite frequently. It's a, a feature of my life. Um, so he encouraged me to explore this topic. Um, so my resources for this talk really are those Darshan conversations with Lama, um, and they're also influenced by uh, Venerable Pema Children's book, When Things Fall Apart, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, as well as um, classical authors like Shanti Deva, um, who is often discussed by Venerable Tipton Children, who's someone that I appreciate a lot. So these are kind of all the influences for my talk today. Um, and if you listen to the talk show that, um, that Lions Roar host called Talk Openly, where myself and my Sangha friend Daniel, who is Unze today, um, we talk about our lives and the Dharma. So you might hear some similar themes today and some experiences from my life. So that was kind of my shameless plug for Talk Openly. It's every Tuesday at seven o'clock um, on Zoom or on Lions Roar's Facebook. So please come to that if you're interested. Um, and at the end of the talk today, I'm hoping we have some time for discussion where folks can share and reflect on their own experiences with this topic and maybe share any antidotes that you use, whether secular or traditional. So there's several different types of depression. One is the kind of like typical idea of depression we might think of when hearing the word. Um, so many of us may have experienced this type of depression, this kind of either heavy sadness or maybe even like a nothingness, blankness, or a type of mixed depression and anxiety that just pervades one's life um, and makes it very difficult to do everyday tasks and take care of oneself. This is more of like a clinical depression. There's also this kind of like existential depression, um, which might be a reason that many of us have uh, come to the temple to explore Buddhism, this kind of dread of like, what's the purpose? And, you know, how could I go on when there's so much horror in the world? Um, you know, which I want to say, it's very reasonable if anyone is feeling that right now. Um, there's a lot to be existentially depressed about right now in our world. Um, then there's another type, which I've experienced along the path, which is when I kind of started to get a very slight glimpse into the impermanence of you know, the things I'm attached to. Um, I get scared and think, but like, gosh, that's so depressing that everything is just going to go away. Um, and then wanting them to kind of, you know, come back to this place of permanence and solidity again, that I, that I can hold on to it. Um, and then there's this other type of depression that is much more subtle and extremely common. And that's the type of depression that I'm gonna talk about today as suggested by Lama. Um, so let's just imagine for a moment, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning from a deep and restful sleep. You got a full eight hours, you're feeling refreshed. You sit down and have like a stable, almost like blissful meditation session. Things are feeling good, you know, like, wow, this is such a great start to the day. As you start getting ready for the day, you notice kind of like a slight tickle on your nose that leads into a round of like some sneezes, your allergies are picking up. Um, okay, no problem. Just kind of do your nasal spray, go about your morning. Um, you get in the car, you go to you start, you know, getting on the way to work and the traffic is horrible. You notice your heart rate is kind of starting to pick up. You kind of worry like, oh my gosh, am I going to be late? Am I going to get there on time? But then you do. Okay, things are fine. Okay, it's better now. Um, then the phone rings and rings and rings. But then someone emails that they brought cake into the break room. Yes. <laughs> so you go and damn it, all the side pieces with all the frosting are taken. You know, you get a sad little small piece and bring it back. Anyways, on and on, you know, the story goes. We get what we want. Things are feeling up. We're getting positive feedback. And then within moments, something happens that we don't want. 
we start feeling anxious, deprived, annoyed, whatever it is. So this is the depression of the everyday. This is the experience of the vast majority of us, right? We've grown so accustomed to this depression, this up and down, that we wouldn't even label it depression. We simply expect good things to happen and cling to them when they arrive and deny the possibility of things we don't want and then get angry and despairing when they inevitably arise and feel justified about our anger. So in Buddhism, this is the second noble truth of the origin of suffering. So attachment to the things we want and aversion for the things that make us uncomfortable. And ignorance of how things really are is the underlying cause of those attachment and aversion responses. We wish things would be different from how they are. We kind of hallucinate permanence on top of everything. And then we use strategies that don't work, that just keep us cycling in anxiety and frustration and at times despair. So the other night I was, um, I was sitting on my cushion after meditation um, and doing some prayers. And I was just kind of like wandering in reverie, that kind of state of non-meditation, um, thinking about my life and things happening within it. And I was just feeling really disgruntled and irritated. Um, you know, if you watch the Talk Openly show, I talk a lot about how irritated I am by my commute, um, you know, work, school, all the things, and just wishing that they would be different. And it kind of just arose within me, the thought, what if this was it? What if there was nothing else, you know, no end point where things will then feel comfortable, satisfying, safe, basically a point where all those struggles just end. There was this kind of like surge of emotion within me not necessarily for wanting that relief, but for recognizing just how much aversion I have for my everyday life. It was quite stunning, you know? And the fact is, you know, all of these parts of my life, my commute, work, school, interpersonal dynamics, the everyday effort just to maintain my body, you know, are my life removing them would mean my life would be gone. So why do I feel such aversion for what is happening? And how does that impact my mind? You know, if I'm constantly rejecting the very stuff that makes up my life, then I'm rejecting life itself, which all sounds like a recipe for depression. <laughs> um, so this kind of, you know, turned my mind towards what seems like such a key factor in so many Buddhist texts, um, both traditional and secular, uh, of acceptance. So what would it be like to recognize that maybe there is nothing else to do but to do this? You know, nothing really to actually be striving towards within everyday life but to experience and engage with it? And what if developing my mind was the goal rather than changing my external experience so that my samsara is just a little bit nicer, right? Finding that ideal samsara um, and accepting, you know, whatever is happening right now, regardless of my opinions about what's happening. It's complicated. <laughs> um, so as we start to move along the Buddhist path, we begin noticing how irrational our responses to the everyday ups and downs are. Of course, we still engage in them. You know, there happens habits that we've built up over eons, so much so that it just seems natural, right? It feels natural to be annoyed by traffic. It feels natural to crave cake and be excited when I get it. <laughs> But all of this ends up feeling somewhat hollow um, when we start to observe what's happening. 
our experience becomes one of just wanting to fill the hole and fill it and fill it. An example for me, I have this wish to constantly like augment my experience of anxiety. And one of the ways I do this is by, you know, scrolling through my phone for an hour. And this seems like a natural response, right? Like I'm having anxiety, so I want to do something about it. And in the moment, temporarily, it does distract me from my anxiety. Likewise, my wish to keep like, you know, good stuff going, like receiving praise from a coworker, for example, um, or pleasure from more food or more sex, it seems like the right thing to do, right? You know, like who wouldn't want more praise or more pleasure? And it's not that these things are inherently bad, right? But how are we thinking about them? How are we perceiving them? What do we expect of them? Do we expect that they will solve the problem of our, you know, kind of inherent dissatisfaction with samsara? That momentary experience we place so much hope on. And so often when these responses to the everyday ups and downs are left unexamined, we end up being chained to and controlled by every passing anxiety or excitement. Um, and, you know, oftentimes acting in ways that bring more suffering over the long term, because we're thinking only about those kind of short term gains or those, you know, short term, like I feel slightly discom discomfortable, uncomfortable, so I need to change something about that. So I often think of this as being uh, like a puppet tied to strings. I feel like that's a really strong image for me. Um, and our masters are these, you know, very kind of these small self-centered attachment and aversion masters, um, you know, that really demand that we get them what they want, um, which is always to receive more praise, good reputation, pleasure, and wealth in various forms, and avoid criticism, bad reputation, discomfort of any kind, and poverty. So these are known as the eight worldly concerns. And when we are puppets to these masters, how do we end up behaving? We have to really reflect on that. Sometimes we might act unethically, like lying to get what we want, um, or something in my case with, you know, wanting to get praise from coworkers, I might engage in gossip to kind of stir things up or make people laugh, you know, which only makes me feel bad. You know, not even like not even in the long term, but the short term, I feel bad, right? Um, and it kind of creates this pattern of behavior where I feel like I need to do it again in order to maintain that relationship ongoing. Um, or, you know, it might be that we layer on the pleasure, right? Until it's like no longer pleasurable, like eating until we're sick. You know, we might stuff ourselves with dinner and then we're like, oh, but you know, I really want dessert and so we just keep eating and again I want to emphasize that you know engaging in these things doesn't mean that we are you know like quote bad people um it just means that we're we're trying to find solutions um to the very real problems of samsara but doing them in a mindless way um I work in a, uh, a psychiatric hospital for people who are experience, experiencing acute mental health crises. And something that is so clear is that anyone who comes in with like suicidal ideation or even an attempted suicide, they're trying to find a solution to their suffering. They're not doing it just because it's something to do or that they're bad people or they're you know not smart enough to try and figure out what's going on. They're trying to find a solution. And that's just a very extreme example of the things that we do on an everyday. So in the moment, it feels like we're doing something compassionate for ourselves. We're, you know, we're trying to relieve our momentary suffering. But unfortunately, those solutions just 
are not aware to the things, the way things actually are, which is that they're constantly changing and lacking permanence. So at best, we're just putting off our experience of depression, of suffering. And at worst, we're making that suffering bigger and bigger until we're harming ourselves and others around us even more. And so that's where the everyday depression might lead into like clinical depression or is leading into the types of, you know, big existential, you know, dreads that so many of us are facing right now, whether it's, you know, climate change or, or any of the other things that we're experiencing is because we're, you know, acting upon our suffering with such uh, momentary solutions that aren't working. So we think that we can achieve permanent happiness from something impermanent. And we think our momentary discomfort or unhappiness is permanent. So we create this confusion over and over again and harm for ourselves to try and get away from something that will actually change with time. A common example of this kind of puppetry of like attachment and aversion and that, you know, continual attempt to augment our experience towards something slightly more comfortable is to use substances, right, to avoid pain and to experience momentary pleasure all the while putting off the growing experience of dread, you know, so that we just have to keep coming back to the substance over and over. A less stigmatized example of this, and one that within our culture even seems, you know, admirable, um, is to be that person who is constantly trying to tie up loose ends. Uh, you know, to get the checklist completed, um, to look like they have it all under control. Um, does anyone have that? I certainly, I certainly do. Um, that kind of experience of like, and now it's done and it will, will be done forever. And now I'm in, you know, I'm back in control now. Um, and, you know, when all the things are done and I'm in control, then I'll be happy. Then I can relax. Um, and it, it just doesn't work that way. Um, these strategies are all ways to try to gain some measure of control in our lives, you know, to try and make permanent the experience of pleasure or to try and make permanent the finalization of the checklist and maybe our reputation as a good worker um, when they only just spin us out farther away from lasting and grounded happiness. They just, they, they just make us, you know, frenzied addicts, right? Attending to our every experience of discomfort or uncertainty as though they can be permanently solved by impermanent solutions. We can also stop to think a moment about, you know, what would happen if we did get that lasting pleasure or tie up all the loose ends? What would happen then? You know, what, what would be the point of our lives really if we were just permanently in that state of pleasure. There's nothing really there. So what would happen instead if we were to accept the reality um, that we will, we will experience discomfort and loose ends? You know, acceptance is about recognizing the shifting nature of our experience and everything around us. This reflection is part of the four thoughts that turn the mind to Dharma which are very powerful meditations that help us shift our minds away from that almost you know, mechanical engagement with desire and repulsion we have with our world. Instead, we reflect on this incredible potential of our current human life um, to consider the effects of our actions, so karma, um, to meditate on impermanence of all things and to see that any gain within samsara is ultimately unsatisfying and will eventually have to leave us. And of course, you know, acceptance is not passive. You know, it's not about being a doormat. We can accept that something is happening while maybe saying no or ref refusing to allow abuse, but we can accept these conditions that we are in, that, you know, we are in um, this, this impermanent system. We are in a, you know, a world where all of our actions, you know, create results. And from that acceptance, we can then make 
intentional ethical decisions from there, rather than being in this cyclical engagement with um, unhelpful actions. So I personally have to be really careful when I'm doing these reflections on the four thoughts that turn the mind to Dharma to do them all together rather than just meditating on impermanence. Um, because something I've noticed in myself and my meditation is this tendency to use that reflection on impermanence as kind of a way out of my current experience. That kind of like, oh, but this, you know, current difficult situation is impermanent. So I'll just, you know, I'll get past it and be done with it. And then I'll get what I want, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and so it's this kind of like manipulation of the teaching of impermanence um, that is just as much a source of depression. Um, so part of my work to be done with everyday depression is to consider, you know, what would it be like to recognize the truth of impermanence within the everyday struggles. So recognizing, yes, this will change, while at the same time accepting and engaging them, them you know, with curiosity and, and even love. What would it be like to hold those moments of exhaustion, boredom, irritation, anger, you know, as well as those feelings associated with everyday happiness, like pleasure, excitement, appreciation, with acceptance, and what I consider to be, you know, the partner of acceptance, which is that kind of like tender awareness. It would be really good, you know, if we could develop that kind of, you know, wise and tender awareness to each moment that arises. So as far as I know, um, someone who is enlightened, but has chosen to remain in cyclic existence as a bodhisattva is still going to experience, you know, these kind of everyday uh, annoyances and frustrations and difficulties and pleasures and enjoyments, you know, things like travel delays, complex family issues, fatigue, illness, pain and pleasure, gain and loss. Um, yet an enlightened person experiences these, these things much differently. So while it's inevitable that we experience changes in our environment and in our bodies, it's not inevitable that we will suffer. An enlightened person also has the awareness that happiness is not some object right? It's not some object to be retrieved in the future or some goal that we will, you know, finally attain and then be done. That kind of, you know, lasting perfect high that I was talking about or the bliss of the finally completed check checklist, like, you know, being done. Um, to chase after happiness as some future goal is the experience of everyday depression. It's misery. So instead, an enlightened being is fully engaged with what is happening right now, regardless of the circumstances, and is focused, you know, not on their own fleeting pleasures or pains, but on supporting others and discovering their own deeply natural and inherent goodness. And I think, you know, in this is an ocean of satisfaction, an unshakable mountain of ease and presence, right? This vast well-being beyond pain and pleasure. And I think, you know, this is the Buddha nature we all have. And we can start to experience some of that as we, you know, begin to meditate on these things. Um, we can experience it when we meet with teachers, right? Who are farther along the path than we are most of the time, much, much farther for me. Um, and they kind of, you know, they can rekindle our awareness of our own goodness. And so I want to end just by encouraging us to remember, too, that, you know, we are part of each other's mandalas. You know, all of us together as, as a sangha, we're creating causes and conditions with each other towards lasting happiness 
um, and presence and the ability to genuinely help one another in this chaotic world. Um, it's not a solitary thing. You know, we think of when we're depressed, it's such a private, you know, lonely thing. And we, we're so stuck in our minds and, and spinning around how to get what we think we want and what we think we need. Um, but this practice of fully engaging with our world and our experience and with one another, it's the exact antithesis to depression and isolation. Um, it's connection, it's community, um, and it's it's engagement with that, you know, true trueness at our core. Um, so with that, you know, I will end and give thanks to our teachers and of course the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So thank you so much. I'd love to open it up for, for discussion. Thank you for the talk, Jack. Um, I was curious, you know, in my own experience, um, the more that I practice Dharma, the easier it is to sort of have faith or confidence in it. You know, so if I find myself in a depressed state, it's, it's easier, the more that I practice, the easier it is to get back into it. And I can use things like the four thoughts that turn the mind. Um, I was curious, though, when we are looking to help people who are not Dharma practitioners, who are caught up in depression. Um, do you have any tips, tricks, suggestions, anything for helping them to maybe break frame and for maybe offering some of this advice without um, necessarily preaching to them or trying to convert or anything like that, but rather just uh, offering helpful advice? I, one thing I notice is um, my depressed friends oftentimes are, you know, incredibly attached to their depression and to the the stories, the narrative that creates it, and so they're they're highly resistant to any type of, um, you know, suggestion <laughs> that it, maybe it isn't exactly the way they're thinking it is. And so, are there, you know, do you, can you think of like um, ways to be supportive and encouraging and to maybe offer some glimmers, something, a way out um, from that sort of cycle? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think one thing that's really important, um, one thing that I've learned both personally and professionally is that we can't um, we can't push people beyond their, you know, current, um, yeah, their current experience or, you know, acceptance of where they're at. Um, and so it, it really has to come from someone, uh, from someone themselves. And so I think the best, absolute best thing that I feel I can do when I'm meeting with someone who's extremely depressed um, is just to sit with awareness myself. Um, and, you know, so it, it has to start from yourself first and being present with that person um, and just, helping them explore their own world. Um, and, you know, if there's possible to find threads of, you know, things that someone is, um, you know, doing well, you know, that's always good to, to bring out. Um, but I think first and foremost, we have to accept that we can't change people. Um, we can only work on our own minds. And when we have presence with people, presence and open awareness, they start to open up to their own presence and open awareness. Um, and I think that is probably the best medicine that we can provide. Yeah, I think that's fantastic advice. In my own experience, I noticed that if I come in with an agenda of my own that I'm gonna somehow fix them right? I, I have an answer, I have a solution, and I try to like craft it in such a way that it's going to help them, then that is not received as help. And in fact, is uh, not helpful at all. It's the opposite. Um, and that and often that might meet with resistance. Whereas what you were saying, the few experiences I've had where I can just sort of sit and be present with what is, it, it's more helpful to them, it sort of gives them space to unravel the story themselves. Yeah, Thanks. for sure. Yeah, and, and so I think sometimes too, we just, we want to let people know that that they're okay to be, you know, them and who they are right now, that 
they don't need to be changed. We don't need to change them. Um, and, and then people start to see uh, their own goodness. Yeah. We have another question for you, just a second. Yes, Jack. I, you didn't speak about like evolution or human biology, but I'm, my mind went there in terms of, do you think we're fighting against like sort of an innate human development to be negative, to try and be happy? That's all. Yeah. That's a good question. I, I don't totally know. I, I'm not super, um, you know, well versed on biology and whatnot, but of the things I have studied about, you know, trauma and the ways that things get stuck in our bodies and minds, um, you know, that that makes a lot of sense. You know, we're we're holding on to negativity because uh we're trying to protect ourselves from being harmed again. Um, and so then, you know, we kind of engage in these unhelpful coping strategies um, uh, to, yeah, get ourselves away from that hurt and pain. And, um, and of course, that just makes it worse in the long run. But no, I think, I think you're right. I was actually in therapy last week. And um, my therapist was, was saying how we are, you know, we really are struggling against a lot of um, kind of biological impulses. Um, so part of the Dharma, I think, is is uh, is learning to accept that that's there and then, you know, be able to put a little bit of space between that experience of our biology and then the choices that we make um, in response to those um, to decide, like, you know, is is this really going to be uh, how I want to respond? Is this an ethical uh, decision? Yeah. And. I don't know if there's anyone else in the the temple, but I think Ellen has her hand raised, and there's also a um, a question in the chat. So maybe Ellen, if you want to go first. Ellen, if, yeah. Hi. Okay. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Sorry, I'm driving, so I'm a little encumbered. I wanted to ask about um, the distraction methods and vices and so forth. I've been kind of having playing with them lightly um, and even kind of embracing them. I wondered what your thought is. Do we go cold turkey and give them all up and be more sort of in the space of having to deal with reality? Or what do you think about all those, you know, scrolling through the phone? And for me, it's Starbucks and I have many, many. But how do we be with those in the interim while we're becoming enlightened? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I think, well, there's some things that I've really tried to just give up cold turkey, you know, like I when I... Um, when I took refuge vows, like one of those things was intoxicants. And, and that was really hard for me. I know for a lot of people, that's one of the barriers to taking refuge is that they're like, but I wanna have a glass of wine every once in a while. Um, but yeah, I think there's plenty of things that we're engaging with on a daily basis, even just like eating my breakfast, right? I'm like, uh, I just like shovel it in, in, like I'm like, I, oh, I want more. Um, and I think that really the, the practice for us as we move along the path is, you know, can we recognize that this thing is not going to last um, and not get so caught up in it? You know, I think Lama is such a great example of how to do this uh, because he's someone who really enjoys like he loves fashion, he loves entertainment, like music and poetry and all those things, you know, which uh, on the surface look like that they're just kind of, they, well, they are momentary pleasures, right? But the way that he's engaging with them is not as though they're like these permanent things or these permanent parts of our identity. You know, they're, they're ways that we can experience the world and also experience reality. If we really look, if we, if we, you know, if we go out and get that donut or that Starbucks, if we just kind of, you know, 
take a bite and just notice what it tastes like, uh, how it's going away in the moment, you know, that itself is an expression of, um, of impermanence and uh, interdependence. So, you know, I think that is really um, what we're trying to do, you know, at, at best, we're, we're trying to remove maybe those, um, those actions um, that are end up being very harmful right? So maybe those kind of perpetual behaviors that have been very harmful, like um, drinking or, you know, uh, negative sexual behavior um, that has been harmful to people. And, and then, you know, so those ones are ones that we're trying to set aside. And then the ones that are our everyday life, we're just trying to bring awareness to it. Um, so that's my, I guess, my thoughts on that. But I'm sure, I'm sure there's more to add for sure. Thank you. Thank you for slightly endorsing my vices. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm going to, um, so there's a question in the chat about, um, do you have any suggestions on dealing with daily anxiety? Um, and I think depression and anxiety are extremely related. Um, you know, anxiety for me, is this feeling that like I have to, I have to do something or I have to get away from something. Um, and yeah, there's just this kind of panic of like, what if I don't get what I want? And though, so then, you know, acting in a way that tries to get me what I want. Um, so in a similar way with the depression, you know, I think as best we can, if we can, um, take a moment to pause and just sit with our bodies, maybe even notice what does the feeling of anxiety, what does it feel like for me? What does it look like? What things start to trigger it? You know, is it, um, for me, some of my anxiety is around receiving bad or, you know, not bad, but construct even constructive feedback. You know, I have such like an ego around my like performance on anything um that like receiving feedback gives me such anxiety and so if I reflect on you know what is the cause of that anxiety it's that I'm I am having this very strong attachment towards people seeing me as you know a good worker or as a good person then I can reflect and think is that really important do I need people to be seeing me a certain way and can I start to untangle some of that and actually, you know, move towards what my actual goals are is that I want to be a helpful and as safe of a person for other people that I can be. And so then that kind of starts shifting the anxiety because then I'm like, okay, well, if this feedback is going to help me be a more helpful and safer person for other people, then maybe that's actually really great. Um, so we can start to shift it a little bit that way. Hey, Jack. Um, this is Connor. Thank you so much for uh, your talk. It's actually it was a lot different than what I anticipated it being and a lot better. So I really appreciate that. Um, something that I, I can hear you sort of tangentially saying in, in my reflection on what you've been talking about is that I had a lot of failures with this since I started practicing. And I think that, um, you know, my failures in uh, just being gentle with myself and trying to actually put into practice being aware of what's going on and trying to, you know, have change in my life it actually makes a big difference, right? Seeing, oh, today I did this and then tomorrow I just totally gave in to all of that depression and I had a horrific day or a horrific month or something just went completely off the rails. And then, you know, I went right back into a uh, staple meditation practice and all of these mm -hmm. went really well. Um, and so it, like, it's not a, you know, it's not like taking the precepts and oh, bam, everything went well everything you know it, it's not just like we kept some vices but like we, i made aspirations or i i, I made things 
as a point that I was going to do something or that I tried to affect change, but I failed. Mm. And I went right back to trying to do it. And I think that um, I've heard you make some examples about that of, I still have these depressions that come up and I still try to just put my awareness on them. And I think that's really important because I have that in my life also. Um, and it, you know, sometimes we don't talk about our, our challenges or our failures really explicitly. Um, and it's, it's good to hear you say some of these things because it's nice to know that I'm not the only one <laughs> that has a hard time. Yeah. Um, or, you know, uh, to have it sort of stated in a way that is more gentle, that you just keep working on it. Yeah. And, and that's important. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that, Connor, because that um, brings up a really important point about how um, deadly perfectionism can be and how um, that can really derail our meditation practice, not, and not just meditation, but our whole um, spiritual path is if we think that we should, you know, be perfect after taking precepts, you know, we're really going to be in trouble. Um, because as you said, like we are, you know, we're, we're imperfect beings, you know, kind of working through this stuff. And that, that is where the path comes to, you know, to fruition is when we can see like, okay, I screwed up how, like, I'm going to work on, you know, this antidote, or I'm going to bring in this thought that turns my mind to Dharma and see how it helps um, like it kind of like, I don't know, I'm imagining this flower opening up, right? You know, uh, it's this engagement between our chaotic life and the Dharma. That's where, that's where the spiritual path is happening. So um, yeah, avoiding perfectionism as much as possible while also recognizing that it's going to come up. <laughs> it's really important. Yeah. Um, I see in the, so there's a question in the chat and then Charlotte has um, her hand up. I'm going to, I'm going to ask or see the question in the chat first. So when I sit just observing sensations, I have a tendency to tighten around them and relaxing seems kind of impossible. Any advice, especially in the head area? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I agree, <laughs> I, that happens to me too. Um, you know, I think what is really useful for me um, is when those kind of tight sensations come up, rather than immediately trying to, uh, re immediately reacting to them, like, oh, I have to, it's almost like a, a little bit of anxiety around, like, I have to change this because I don't like how this feels. Um, instead, just saying, wow, that's that's a tight feeling. That's, that's an anxious feeling. How about I just, uh, ex you know, explore what that feels like? And noticing how does it shift? Because, you know, any of these things with depression and anxiety is we think that they're permanent, right? That they're solid, um, that they're, you know, unchanging. And what's actually happening is that they're, they're changing over time. So we can notice that, we can observe that in meditation. And that can be a really uh, cool exercise to help us see the nature of impermanence, um, so I would recommend that, you know, if you notice that sensation in meditation, you don't have to move to trying to fix it or trying to make yourself more comfortable, but noticing the sensation. You can also, um, Lama has uh, uh, shown me a meditation before where you're noticing the painful sensation while at the same time noticing a sensation in your body that it's not in pain or maybe even that feels good and recognizing, wow, both of those are happening at the same time. It's really interesting. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what your question um, was about, but yeah, okay, good. All right, Charlotte. Hi, Jack. Hi. Um, I'm just thymic, so that means, you know what that means, but for everyone else, um, it's kind of like bipolar, except without the, the high, manic highs. It's I am normal or depressed, basically, are my two <laughs> stages. Yeah. And uh, that's been a lifetime thing. So what I've found is that when I start feeling the, the down part of my cycles, 
if I sit with that and just open myself up to it and kind of go, come on in. It's been a, been a while since I've seen you hang out for a while. Um, it eases, it goes away. Um, and so my depression, since I started practicing 12 years ago or whatever it was, has been much more manageable and much lighter. I still have occasional bouts, but they're um, they are manageable because they're not scary. Yeah. I don't have to be frightened of them. I don't have to tighten up against them. I know it's just a cycle and it comes and goes and I can deal with it. It's it doesn't change anything permanently because it's not permanent. Okay. Um can you speak to that in any add anything to that? Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you spoke, uh, yeah, very, very clearly to that experience. And um, yeah, I, I love what you said about, you know, when we get a little bit more familiar with these experiences or feelings, um, it really diminishes their scary power. <laughs> um, that happens with anxiety people who have panic attacks right you know um they fear the anxiety and that just makes it makes everything implode you know um and so if we don't fear the sensation or fear it less and just get familiar with it um you know we're going to be much more likely to just let it have its take its natural course um rather than making it worse or maybe using strategies that help in the short term, but but don't in the long term. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, any other thoughts or um, questions or complaints as Lama says? <laughs> I see, um, I I see a hand from Johnny and then Susan. Uh, Johnny, do you, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, just wanted to say first, thank you for the talk. I thought it was really cool. Um, and I honestly, I think me and probably a lot of people related to a lot of what you said. Um, but I just, I kind of want to share like an experience I had somewhat recently that I think kind of got me coming to um, Lions Roar uh, Dharma Center. Um, I started coming this year, but um, in January. And I think part of what got me there is that I had been in school working to achieve a certain goal for a long time. And somehow as I got closer to the goal, I got more anxious and more depressed instead of the opposite, which is what you would think would happen. Like I, instead of feeling like, oh, oh my gosh, I've accomplished this, I feel really good all I felt was more scared, mm. which I thought was really interesting. And um, I knew that it, there was more done back there than I could understand in the moment. So that's part of why I started looking to practice things is like um, what's offered here. But anyways, I, I just wanted to see if, I guess like, is that something, I, I don't know if that's something you've experienced before is like getting closer to a goal can somehow cause getting close, like le having a purpose almost leave you can cause more depression, you know? That's really interesting. Um, can, can I ask, are you still in school? I mean, it doesn't necessarily matter, but <laughs> I'm just curious. No, yeah, feel free to, yeah. Um, I actually, so I graduated in May and, okay. um, which is great. And I now work um, and everything, which, but then it, it's, and it's been a great, it's been, I think, mostly a good experience, but I, again, they're like, it was just interesting to me how many fears it also brought up in me. Yeah. And I just wanted to see if that's like a, a common thing or if not. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 I'm guessing that there's people who have 
have that experience in the room. Um, as someone who dropped out of the grad program in my second of three years, <laughs> I understand. I'm back in. I'm at, <clears throat> back in a grad program. Um, yeah, I wonder if there's something about like, uh, yeah, that we've created this identity around this thing that we're working on. Um, and so we feel that it's it's permanent and then noticing like, oh, it's shifting. Like that's horrifying. That's so scary. Um, you know, I think there's so many ways that that happens throughout our lifetime. Um, so yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's, it's another example of how when we're super, um, super attached to different things in our lives as being these permanent fixtures, how that can really disturb us um, and make life really difficult. So thank you. Yeah. And I'm glad that you finished school. Good job. <laughs> um, Susan, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, Jack. Thank you for your talk. It was really good. Um, you mentioned something in there that I thought was really interesting when you said that it, you found it was important when you're um, meditating on the uh, four thoughts that turn the mind towards Dharma, that it was important to include all four and not get stuck on any one of them. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure. Yeah, I think that's where, so there's that idea of spiritual materialism, where we can take an idea within our spiritual practice, and then manipulate it towards our own kind of self-centered aims. <laughs> and so my example was how I tend to uh, use the very important and uh, helpful meditation on per impermanence, um, to kind of get out of my current situation rather than engage with it. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of think like, okay, well, this is all impermanent anyways. So like, you know, just F it. I, I don't have to worry about it because it's going to be gone soon. <laughs> um, and, and so it does this thing of like uh, allowing me to back out of the moment rather than experiencing it. And then do you pull in one of the other three thoughts? Yeah, yeah. So I think that one, especially the one about, you know, um, everything within samsara is unsatisfactory. So it reminds me that, okay, when I get out of this situation, like, even if I move to something that feels a little bit nicer, it's still samsara. Um, so really what I need to be working on is my mind. Um, and 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 training my mind to see um, the nature of reality and and that this self that I you know imagine as being permanent is 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 not um, and and so I think I really need that reminder as well as karma you know that my um, all of my actions that I engage with have a result and so in the moment if I'm thinking okay I just can get out of this because it's impermanent then I'm kind of creating this this um, pattern in my mind to just avoid. And I don't want to do that. Um, so that's really helpful to include karma in there as well. And to also include, you know, the preciousness of my human life um, to remind myself, okay, this, this is my life. Engage with it. This is the, you know, the mud and the, you know, everything that's, that's coming together to, um, for me to learn um, the Dharma. So engage with it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, Eli here. How, how are you doing today? <laughs> you Hi, well? Eli. <laughs> Been a little bit, but um, yeah, this talk was like really resonating. Um, just because I'll try to kind of like make it concise. Like, it just brought up yeah, so many thoughts around it. Um, but yeah, I mean, part of my reason for really coming to temple in the beginning, especially was, yeah, I was like down, you know, this and that young guy coming into the world and all, um, <laughs> but yeah, through time, I just wanted to like, one of the things that really has helped recently has become just a little bit more clear recently. And that helps in any times of, you know, if a little depressed mood or whatever comes back, which is thankfully happening less and less, but is, um, kind of like asking that question, like, you know, where is the I? to attach or become this inherent depression 
you know, is this depression this inherently existing thing that can attach and become me, you know, or whatever this I is. So it's like, um, I don't know how to describe that, but it's like, it kind of, it's almost like a little jarring for like a little second in like a very good way, because it kind of just creates this little gap, like this little kind of like entry point of like, oh, wait, like this is a, you know, impermanent phenomenon that is based on all these different causes and conditions. And it's that bubble dream, lightning and cloud kind of situation. And like, um, yeah, it's really cool seeing that because then in that case, I just remember that there's choice in that moment and there's like a relationship there, uh, you know, same situation, but how can that relationship be different towards whatever that suffering is or the, the depression? And yeah, just that little bit of space from kind of asking that question, you know, like, yeah, like, is this depression, this inherently existing thing that I'm, you know, that I can become, you know, is it me? Am I it? Um, you know, and just kind of that, again, focusing on that relationship. I thought I had something else to say, but I don't remember, but <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, so kind of like choice. And then of course, too, like, it's not rejecting it or saying, oh, well, there's no relationship here at all, or it's over there, I'm here, you know, it's, um, yeah, because it's, it's not like that spiritual materialism, kind of like you said, like, oh, it's impermanent, or if there's no I, then I'm not gonna, you know, be depressed or whatever, but, um, and then I guess, like, the final thing, too, is, like, I remember Lama talking about it, like, approaching phenomena and whatnot, like, like your children, you know, and I don't have kids, but just remembering that, like, oh, like, these struggles, that come, I do want to approach them like, you know, if I did have a kid, that's whatever those feelings would be. Like, I want to care for you, you know? Like, if a kid came up to me crying, I wouldn't want to say, hey, go away, leave me alone, you know? So that one kind of been hitting very heavy lately, <laughs> like really kind of getting involved with whatever struggles come and giving them that love. So yeah, I think those are the big, big things that really have helped lately. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But yeah, thank you too. Yeah, those are really, really good ideas. And, and I love how you touched on, you know, we can, we can engage with our experience without um, making it permanent, and also without rejecting it. Um, and that's a very clear headed way um, to approach these difficult things. And um, yeah, I love what you said about about Lama, you know, encouraging us to just hold them with that tender awareness as though they were our children. So thank you so much. Well, if there's no other thoughts, thank you, everybody. It's been really beautiful to hear from, from everyone. Um, yeah, I look forward to seeing some of you in person in September. That'll be great. Thank you, Jack. Uh, we'll do dedication now. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losong Drakpa, I make replace. Yep. 
All right, I think we have a few announcements, a couple at least. Uh, one of which is that in uh, September, we don't have a date yet, but at some point in September, there will be a refuge ceremony and entering the path. So if you're interested in taking refuge or um, entering the path, either one of those, um, then you can talk to me and I'll pass uh, that information along. Um, also coming up in October, uh, there's a chaplaincy retreat with Geshe Gendon and Lama Jimpa, and that date will also be announced soon. I don't know if there are any other announcements. Yeah, Sue has one. Hang on. Hi, this is Sue, and I just I want to say thank you very, very much, Jack. It was fabulous to hear you and see you. But I just wanted people to know that this Wednesday at 6 o'clock at the meditation um, group, I'm going to be doing a sound meditation and with bowls and um, finger symbols, and I'm inviting anyone to come and uh, try this experience. So 6 o'clock on Wednesday for the sound meditation. All right, I think that's it.